can go ahead and get started. And as you um, come along um, and join us and welcome, and we're so glad that you're here, but really just welcome everyone as we get kicked off to tonight's Lean Into Allyship event. Um, Reimagining Reentry, A Mess to a Message is our topic for the evening. And we are so excited and honored to have Aaron Hicks, founder of Focused Interruption and Nehemiah Reentry Coordinator here with us as tonight's special guest, as he and Dr. G talk about the impacts of the criminal justice system, the challenges faced by community members during the journey of reentry, and how you, how we can be active participants in a dignity-centered holistic approach to reentry. So we want to jump into the event as soon as we can to give Dr. G and Aaron as much time as possible and then open up the conversation to your questions as we always do. Um, so just a quick few housekeeping items to get us started. We will have the chat function turned off during this event to allow our Nehemiah team to share some awesome valuable resources and content throughout the event, but please do use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen to interact with us. If you are new to the Lean Into Allyship series, don't worry about capturing everything that is on tonight. We send out a follow-up email, including all of the resources um, and everything that's shared, including the recording of this event and a link to where previous events are stored on Justified Anger's YouTube page um, and a whole bunch of good stuff. So please just be present tonight and soak in the information and ask your questions. Um, and then we will package everything up for you as a follow-up um, after the event. And so as you've likely heard, us advocate in the past, we ask that you strongly consider donating to Nehemiah as we cannot and do not expect them to support these events and um, educate us in our growth and development for free. Um, and we also encourage you to use your company's donation match program if they do offer that to really maximize the impact of your dollar. Um, and lastly, just a reminder that this hour is really for all of us, right? And our intention behind the Lean Into Allyship series is to empower would-be allies by creating an honest and actions-driven space to grow together. And we want you to be active participants in the conversation. So you really drive the second half of the discussion. So please enter your questions as they come up throughout the night. Um, and it's really helpful if you don't wait, as we often get a lot towards the end and aren't able to get to all of them. Um, so as we're going through and you have a question, please share it and we will um, make sure to, to keep it tracked so we can get to it when we get to that section. So with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, as we dig in, we wanted to take a moment to ground ourselves for tonight's conversation by sharing in the Q&A simply one word or one phrase that you would use to describe a good neighbor. So please enter into the Q&A one word or phrase that you would use to describe a good neighbor. And we will carry this with us and revisit this question again at the end of our time together. Awesome, we're seeing those responses come in. Thank you so much. We're seeing understanding, trustworthy, caring, kind, empathetic, friendly, respect, respectful, thoughtful, welcoming and supportive, a lot of kindness, respect, reliable, trust. Excellent, thank you so much. And so again, we're just gonna kind of hold on to that and carry that with us um, through the conversation and we will revisit um, at the end of our time together tonight and just kind of expand on, on um, what we've just shared and kind of what instantly and initially came to mind for you. So before I pass things over to Dr. G, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce him for those that might be new to our group. always just really express all of that for his commitment to this Lean Into Allyship initiative. Dr. G is the president, founder, and visionary of the nonprofit Nehemiah Center for Urban Leadership Development. Their vision is to engage the greater Madison community to empower African-American individuals, families, and communities to bring about hope, transformation, and justice. Nehemiah's work focuses on five core areas, including education, economic development, incarceration, family and community wellness, and leadership and capacity development. Dr. G has over 35 years of experience in this space of serving as an advisor to leaders across the world, and his efforts have included educating, coaching, and mobilizing white allies, which brings us to this evening. Welcome, Dr. G. Thank you for your support and your trust and investment in us, and we will ask that you take it from here. Samantha, thank you. And, and as I say each time that we, um, we come into this space, that I appreciate you and your team. And, and if I start naming people, I'll, I'll space out because I get tired by the end of the day. 
for the folks at Generator, you and Dan, for consistently doing this for over a year, creating a platform for me to talk with aspiring um, white allies or non-Black allies who want to be in meaningful discussions and communication about what are the next steps. Um, it seems as if we have this fixation with crises. So when there is something tragic that happens in the news, we're all up in arms. And so I appreciate that you all are working with my team to create an ongoing discussion, a conversation about things that are happening so that we don't have to wait for a crisis to act. We want to keep our foot on the gas. And so um, that, is, that is very exciting. So appreciate being here. Samantha, um, I, am, I am excited about being able to talk with um, Aaron, uh, Aaron Hicks. So tonight is gonna to be really exciting and really special. Um, Aaron Hicks is, first of all, before I get into to this, I just wanna say, can we put, well, let me just say this. Aaron Hicks is a very special uh, person. Um, he's been a part of my staff. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Aaron, what, seven years now, Aaron? More like nine. But more like nine, you know, where, where's the time going? And um, someone who inspires me, not only because um, of what he's done with his life, but the things that he continues to do in his life, uh, with his life, the questions that he asks, the buttons that he, that, he, that he pushes, but also his ability to be transparent. And so tonight, um, I want us to talk about, I wanted to have a, a discussion with Aaron just about his life. So often we talk about programs, but I think we'll get to that, but, uh, or maybe we won't, but talking about Aaron's life helps you to understand the level of the programming that, that we offer. Um, I met Aaron when he was just released from, from prison. Someone inside prison told him about me and about our church and about our organizations. He came to a group called Man Up that I started. Aaron is now a full-time employee. He runs that group. He is, he is a facilitator extraordinaire. Um, and it's so amazing. Uh, and it makes sense because he used to take the group over when I was facilitating it. I would try to get a word in and I really couldn't because he was coming up with all these ideas and these thoughts. But, um, but the fact that he's using that wisdom and his lived experience to help us serve the broader community in such a meaningful way. But I thought it would be really great just to get a little bit to know a little bit more about this incredible young man. Um, we, we have the same birthday, a couple years apart, about 10 years apart. Uh, so we just had a connection right from the, from the beginning. So, so Mr. Hicks, thank you so much for being on Lean Into Allyship. And, uh, and thank you for being willing to talk with me just about your life and your journey, man. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a blessing. It's been a man, it's been an amazing ride. Um, but we continue to do some very innovative and very real things that I believe that people should hear and know about what's going on with yeah. us here at ne Nehemiah. Definitely. Can we put that picture, that that um, that advertisement picture with Aaron on it? Can we just put that back up for a moment? I know I'm throwing a curveball. Aaron knows where I'm going. So Samantha or Dan, can can we put that back up? You got it. Aaron, I don't know if this is a professional photo. I don't know if I authorized this. You look kind of super fly. This is, this is, I don't know, kind of sexy looking, Aaron. And so um, what, did, did you go to a professional photographer to get this photo done? Because actually, I, I did. Actually, I did. Um, you did. Actually, the, the person who took this picture, the professional, um, was Anthony Cooper, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know I was gonna give you a hard time about that picture. Like, you know, looking all suave, your eyes are kind of squinting a little bit. You know, it made me think about Ryan O'Neill, Superfly. I know it's before your time, Aaron, but you know, I, ah, and you might want to play that down a little bit. I'm not really sure if that's the image I want on my team. We'll let that slide now. I'm glad you grew the beard out and stuff like that. Yeah, that's just kind of a little like Rico Suave. And so we might just need to talk about that. All right, a little bit. All right, Samantha. Okay. Dan, we, can take piece, we can take that piece down. I had to, <laughs> I had to give my heart. Aaron, listen, we're going to jump into stuff talking. Let me just ask you Let's a couple questions, man. Listen, and, and as I, I do, I do from, um, from my podcast, Black, Black Icebreaker. But man, in our community, what has to happen to make somebody say, man, I almost slapped my mama? What, what, what has to happen in our experience in the African-American community to make somebody want to slap their mama? Man, why, I'm talking about if you if you cook the food the right way with the right kind of seasoning, 
Oh my goodness. That would make you want to slap your mom. So when's the last time you've had food so good you thought about slapping your mom? I know your mother's not with us now, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful of that. No, no. But let's just say, when's the, when's the last time you had a meal so good that you thought, I might have to slap my or somebody, like somebody's mama getting slapped. Like when is the last time you had mama slapping good? So so I'm I'm actually doing a project with the uh, with the UW. Um Every Wednesday, we hold a group, um, and the person who's cooking, um, <laughs> we get a meal. We have a meal. I'm talking about she really, she really showed out. She showed up. She showed out, and uh, that was one of the meals where you was ready. To, man, I'm talking about cornbread, greens. Like oh. she was really, oh, yeah, she's really showed twitching. out. My hands twitching when you say, <laughs> "Where's the powder? Where's the powder?" <laughs> That's right. Man. Man, Aaron, are you old enough to remember the Fat Albert series? Fat Albert cartoons? I got a question for you then, since you're going to ask me that. What was the cartoon that Fat Albert and them used to watch? Oh. Yeah. The Black Knight? Yeah. The Brown Hornet. The Brown Over Hornet. Here. I knew it had some, oh, so you're going to try to get me on the Black Icebreakers. All right, who is your favorite character on Fat Albert? I, I gotta go with Rudy. You like Rudy? No, I, I like Rudy. Rudy was Bill's little brother. His walk, his walk, his walk, his head always was. That's oh, that was. Rudy, the guy that used to walk kind of like this. Rudy, is he the one yeah. who, wore, who wore the cap? He did. That no, you talking? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, not much mouth. I, I'm not talking about much mouth. Who wore not that? Not much head. mouth. Uh uh. Rudy. Not, that's right. You look like Rudy on that picture you took. That looked like a picture Rudy would have taken. Hey man, last question. What was your favorite cereal growing up? Did you, have, did you have a favorite cereal? It, I did, and that was Frosted Flakes. Man, man, I got you. I used to put sugar on Frosted Flakes as a kid. No, see, you can't do that. That's that's too much. My mom wouldn't be looking. They, yeah, yeah, I used to put a little bit of sugar on it. I had some, I had some, some issues. Man, Aaron, now I was really serious, bro. Um, you inspire me in this work because you remind me of the relevance of it. I love the fact that when you have ideas about how we can serve people better you speak up. I also love the fact that you don't forget the systemic part of the work, mm. that it's not just about bandaging people and fixing people and rescuing mm. people, but there's a systemic reality that needs to happen. And what I love is it don't matter who's in the room. It could be Kelly Thompson, who's our state's public defender. It could be a former, you know, we had a federal prosecutor in our, in our justified anger um, criminal what? justice team. It could be Sheriff Mahoney. It don't matter. You will speak up and say, why do we keep talking about trying to fix a system when it's working the way it was designed? And it mm. just the silence to the room because we do keep talking about something as if somehow the criminal justice system somehow got off the rails. And your point was, these are the rails it was built to be on to disenfranchise certain people so that they never reach their potential. Just talk to me a little bit about what it means to you to state mm -hmm. boldly that the criminal justice system is doing just what it was designed to do. So the, the reason I, I shared in that perspective and through that lens is because um, whenever you think something is broken, your mind goes to, well, we can fix it. The problem with that is the system, if you ask a hundred people, is the system broken? All of them will say, Absolutely. The system is broken. The problem with that is it's not. It's not. It never has been. And it's producing the very things and the very outcomes, the measurements and the outcomes that they talk about. It produces the very things in which it was designed to do. Wow, Aaron. Wow. Just just go on a little bit more because people are trying so, to, to, so, lean in to understand this. And, and so, right. So so. You pay time for what you've done. You off paper. You gain from right. employed. You know you've raised your daughter. You know you know what it's like to be married. You know it's like to take care of bills. So it's not like you need to come on here in front about anything. You're speaking very honestly because there's no double, right. double jeopardy. You know you 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 can say whatever you need to say. You're not just making it. You're not just making this up. You're trying to help us to understand there's a system at work, and it, it's right. no. There's no place else in the country where it's more gruesome for black people, specifically mm. black men than, than, than Wisconsin. And you come through that system and you're telling us 
this what is this is what it was designed to do when most people think that place is for bad people and it keeps our streets safe you're saying it creates more black more bad people so let, let, let me let me let me give you an example of what i mean let, let's take it away just for a second away from the criminal justice system i believe for people who not everybody watches basketball but majority some people do some people don't whatever sports but i'm gonna just use basketball as an example primarily if you was to watch a basketball game it's going to probably primarily make up a people of color okay. um with that being said that i mean I, I get it i understand it now the question has to be asked they they make a lot of money extremely a lot of money what's interesting to me is the fact that how many black owners of a basketball team do we have well the answer to that is one. Does that mean black people don't want to be owners of basketball teams? Absolutely not. But we understand that there's a culture that has been created in some way, shape or form um, that does not, it does not allow black people to enter into that. And so because they are not able to enter into that, we have a system that has been designed a very strategic way. And throughout time, you see this system being used in every aspect of life, whether it be financially, whether it be in the education field. Like I'm doing work with the people at the UW, right? And I ask those questions, even with them. I'm just, you know, things to make you say, hmm, why? Why is it? Does that mean black people don't want to be educated? Absolutely not. But we have created a system in which it has um, not allowed people of color to be involved in. Right. And so that with that being said, now, when you turn it and take it into the criminal justice system, right, um, you start to see the same narrative. I had a judge say to me, this was the exact words. He said to me, I never took on this position to lock up black and brown people. And you know what I said to him? I said, you're absolutely right. If that would be the case, we could take you out of the equation and we could put someone else in the equation and it would change the narrative. But see how the system is designed, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter. who you are. It doesn't matter what color you are because the system is designed a certain way and whoever takes on that position, guess what they'll be doing? They'll be locking up black and brown people. And it's based on how the system has been designed. And until we understand this design and that it's not broken, and it's not until we eradicate the whole system in itself and bring people together in its full totality so that we can get perspectives from all around the board versus as just one narrative, we can't really have a, a successful system in the sense of success for all. Right. And, and Aaron, you're not just out here um, saying this stuff because it feels good or sounds good. You're trying to open people's eyes to understand this system Absolutely. is jacked up. And if we want something new, we got to create something better. Um, right. I've seen some of this stuff firsthand about how the system is. Um, I had a friend who wanted to offer Aaron a full-time job because part of Aaron's stipulation, part of, part of what was um, um, his probation was that he needed to get gainful employment so that he could be back with his family, you know? So the system forced him to not live with his wife and daughter. I still don't understand that. The system forced him to not live with his wife and daughter. So he had to spend money um, to get another apartment. And he was told that if he got gainful employment, found a guy who owned a newspaper, took Aaron in for the interview. I went and accompanied him on the interview. I brought the owner of the newspaper and want him to do sales. The agent who works for the Department of Corrections said, well, do you know what he went to prison for? He said, no, he's out, he's done his debt to society. He's out here, I know he's got some good experiences. I mean, so, and I wanna, I wanna give him a shot. She said, do you know the whole story? Um, um, I don't wanna tell all the story, Aaron, but, but, but she said, well, he can't use a computer. He goes, well, so if you hire him, he, someone else is gonna have to enter his data because he, he can't be on a computer. And Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're, the thing for which you were, the crime for which you were sent to prison had nothing to do with computers. The Absolutely not. internet wasn't even out when you, when you, when you went That's out. Right. It wasn't, wasn't even like that. 
She kept pushing buttons. She goes, well, he can't go into an Applebee's. He said, why? I said, well, because that's a bar. She goes, Applebee's is a, like a community grill. It's a restaurant. It's not a bar. It has a bar in it. Well, still, he can't go to an Applebee's. So then who are you going to call on for sales? She kept pushing this executive until he said, you know what? I'm done. I'm not going to do it. He went in there, a black CEO, had the amount, had the ability to hire Aaron, to help Aaron earn enough money to move back with his family. And this agent kept pushing and pushing and pushing until right in front of my eyes, the CEO said, you know what? I'm, I'm good. Sorry, Aaron. Walked out. Aaron never got that job in that place. Had I not been there, I would have thought that's propaganda. Come on, Aaron, something else happened. She knows you can't get your life together until you get a job. You can't get a permanent address until you get a job. She needled that CEO until he rescinded the offer. The job was yours. We just needed her to rubber stamp it. That's right. That's a design. It's not helpful. If her job is to help you reenter into society, doesn't she understand that one of the best social programs is a job? That's right. And That's you right. had strong abilities, great communication skills. You could have made a killing in that job. That could have led to something full time. And she, right. she she stopped it. And so I certainly get what you mean, man, when you say that this is designed, because we're not saying, you're not saying there are not crimes. There are not things for which prison is the appropriate penalty. Right. If you have untreated mental health issues and you get no mental health services, if it's drug addiction and it's related to mental health issues and no one's talking about it, if you get no GED assistance or helping to get your education together, you're just being warehoused making making um, um, apparel or furniture for the state of Wisconsin, but you're not being rehabilitated so that you can enter society. Then when you pay, what was your last stint, Aaron? 12 years? That's right, 13. 13 years. So when you come back out, you got debt, you got to pay restitution. They should want you to work. And the very people whose job it was to steer you back into community became the roadblock. And the sad thing sure. is, Aaron, you're not an exception. It's this is a common theme. It's a common theme. This is something that you see on a regular. And and because you see this on a regular, um, it becomes that much more harder um, to deal with because we know that in order for people to be successful out in the community, they, they will need some type of employment. And it shouldn't just because they're OK as long as you work at a McDonald's or warehouse. Anything outside of that, let me give you one other example. Since you talked about employment, I had an opportunity to become a parking meter person. Uh, and that would have paid me richly. And I had the whole Southside police station behind me to bag this to make sure I could get this job. And I went and I took this to my agent and I was like, look, I got an excellent opportunity. Here's the job. This is what the job description consists of. Um, and she told me you would have too much power. And so for that reason, I was not able to obtain that job either. And she um, could unilaterally do that without a judge's intervention, without a supervisor's intervention, without a bench. None of that. She had the she had that much power over your life to make that decision. Yep. Yep. And it would have been a living wage. So the, the pay would have been really good. It would have really put me in a great position. However, Again, because they have so much power, and we know that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, and without people really challenging that, um, it, again, I do believe on the flip side of that, um, in all honesty, I realize now, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. Really, the objective was to keep me at Nehemiah. I, so, I see that now, though. Sure, but but at the time we didn't, but we didn't know that though, Aaron. We didn't. That's we didn't, right. We didn't. Aaron, we didn't. Do you remember? Do you, remember um, you all um, years ago. This is before Aaron worked for us. I hired a life coach to create a certification through Nehemiah that was called a reentry coach. You know, yeah. we now it's it's now part of the work. It's morphed. It's some of the work that Aaron and his team does through Focus Interruption Coalition. But it was a way to allow people who are formerly incarcerated to help people coming out of prison because. If you, if you have issues with drinking, you can go to AA and be around people who understand that. You know, NA, Overeaters Anonymous, you can relate to people who understand. You come out of prison, you're most likely sitting with a white female who's never been around Black people, never socialized with Black people, other than her clients don't know Black people, making decisions about Black people and their families and their children and their economics. And so we created a training 
so that we could help men like Aaron, help men like Aaron who's coming out of prison. Aaron's agent from the Department of Corrections said he cannot enroll in your program. And I said, well, why not? She said, who are you to call him a leader? I said, well, I have a doctorate in transformational leadership. I think I know how to spot doctors. I'm certain I'm how to spot leaders. I'm certainly more qualified than she was as an agent to know leadership. We had to fight to allow mm. Aaron to come to a free program, to get a free certificate, to be called a re-entry coach because the agent said that's too much power and how do you have the right to call him a leader? I, I thought we were looking for community partners. I thought we were trying to get people to help with the rehabilitation. I thought they wanted you out of the prison system. Obviously, I was wrong. And the second thing I'll say, Aaron, is when I met with, I can't remember which Secretary of Corrections it was at the time, and we're talking about your case, and I kept referring to you as someone formerly incarcerated, the community, the community corrections director said, excuse me, Reverend G, why do you keep referring to these folks as formerly incarcerated? And I said, because he's not in prison. He's formerly, she said, he's still on paper. And in the state of Wisconsin, if you are still on paper on parole, you are still considered an inmate. He's just outside, but he is still an inmate. He is not formally incarcerated. He is still incarcerated. And I said, mm. she helped me because she said what I thought. But the audacity to correct my language, to not refer to you as someone mm. formerly incarcerated who spent the majority of your adult life in prison, too much of it in prison, she corrected me that I did not have the right to refer to you as formally incarcerated because you mm. So Aaron, what you've done for me is helped me to live in, live live up close on some of these things because I wouldn't I wouldn't have believed it. I remember one time you were having another issue with your agent. Um, I'm going to tell two stories. One is we called a community forum where we had your your landlord, we had your psychologist, we had your employers, you had people there supporting you, and we invited DOC for a community meeting. They want community interaction. They felt very uncomfortable. Who are we to call this kind of meeting? And we just said. We're vouching for this guy. You're not out here by yourself, DOC. We're vouching for him. We had a great meeting. We challenged them about some of their some of the things that they had done. By the end of the day, Aaron wound up locked up. The the police right. got him. There was some right. snafu with his ankle bracelet. He ended up in jail on a PO for a parole a parole officer hold on King weekend. So this is going to be a long weekend. Yeah. And that Tuesday, he was going to start his next semester at Madison College, where he had just made the dean's list. He's going to second semester on the dean's list, and he is sitting up in jail. Just um, ironically, the same day we're sitting on his behalf, explaining to DOC, you all have a horrible system with rehabilitating folks and getting them back in the system. We're this man's support system. Listen to us. The response was, I had to call, I had to go all the way up to the regional chief. I had his cell phone and he made a woman who lived in Beloit, Janesville or yes. Beloit. He didn't even have her at that meeting that day, but because he understood what a crap storm this was gonna be if it got into the media, because it was clearly retaliation um, or ineptitude, he made her come from Janesville, from Rock County, back to Madison to get you out. One of my friends who was a police officer said, I've never seen an agent come and get someone out of jail the same day she locked him up. That happened. That's right. That's right. That's right. You got a good memory. <laughs> Man, well, I mean, Man, you got a good memory. Because, Aaron, I, I mean, I live in this community. I, I consider myself a community influencer. I didn't believe that this stuff was going on. I, I didn't believe that it that it could go on. And so to see the retaliation against you for advocating for yourself was just, man, it was just, it was appalling that that could happen on our watch. And I said, but what about all the people? What about the men like you and the women like you, Aaron, who were locked up on false pretenses and didn't have somebody in a corner who had the regional chief's cell phone? That's right. I gave him a call. He called me back and I said, when this hits the media, this is going to look really bad on you. You don't want to do this. He made a phone call and had somebody come from Janesville to get Aaron out of that hole. Yeah, that's he, right. would have, he would have missed the first day of class. How, you know, how disheartening would that have been? So, Aaron, I want to hear you talk some more. I'm talking, I'm talking. Yeah. To, so that's okay. You. That's okay. Let me just share something with you real briefly. Please. 
I, I was having a conversation. They just had an event here in Madison at Luna's, which is a, a Spanish um, store here. Um, and it's over in my area. And I went over there. Um, they had a little event, festivals and all of that. And I was having a conversation with an officer. And he was just sharing with me how he was just tired. And now he's just trying to, you know, get through what he got to get through so he can retire, so on and so forth. And after I listened to his conversation, I shared a thought with him. I shared with him that, you know, he just wanted to get out. He wanted to retire. And I get all of that. I, I, I get it. Like, it, it makes sense. But I also shared with him he has an obligation. Um, he was like, they're not going to hear me. They're not going to listen to me. All of these different things. And I'm listening to him. But the one thing I share with him is you have an obligation. You have an obligation based on your position. When you understand how the system is operating, then it's your obligation to be a light in a very dark situation. And I shared with him that when a crime is being committed, let's say, Pastor G, you commit, you commit a crime, right? Mm -hmm. You commit a crime, and I clearly see that you're committing a crime. I see it. I understand clearly what you're doing. But I'm not even doing nothing, but I'm seeing it and I'm not saying nothing. You know what that's called in my world? That's called party to a crime, right? Mm -hmm. And what I share with the officer, if in fact you don't say anything and you clearly see being on this force, the injustices that's taking place, guess what that's called? It's called party to a crime. So what I wanna share with the people collectively, when you have the information, when you know that injustice is taking place and yet you still don't say nothing or you just say, you know what, well, I'll just sit on the bench or I'm just not going to say anything. Well, consciously or unconsciously, you are party to a crime because you clearly see what's going on. You know that this is not right. This is not how we're supposed to treat people in any way, shape or form. And my issue, just so you know, Pastor G, my issue has been, I don't have a problem with accountability, but if we're gonna use that verbiage, if we're gonna use that kind of word, then I believe strongly that we have to, if, if, the, if the powers that be are not held accountable, how do you hold a community, how do you right. hold someone like me accountable if you're not gonna hold when we had an officer shoot his wife and shoot his wife's sister and they found him not guilty? If I shoot anybody in the toe, I'm going to do a whole bunch of time. So it, it's, it's those things. I, I, I'm okay with the system if, in fact, it's going to reach all people. But what I've noticed, it does not. It does not reach everybody. Everybody is not being held accountable. And that's a crime within itself. Sure. Right. And, yeah. and, 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 and But we don't call that a crime. We don't call that criminal. But it's very criminal when you can when you can be able to see a, a officer beat somebody half to death, right? And 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 yet you that's not a crime, right? When, what happened to what happened to Rodney King? The whole world saw that, and all of them were found not guilty. You had an opportunity to speak to the five guys who were convicted of sexual assault. Now they're called the five the uh, exonerated five, right? Right. But what happened to those, all of those individuals who the, the, the courts, the DA, the attorneys, all of those people were involved in a crime for five kids who never committed a crime at all. But guess what? They didn't consider that as a crime. And so I marvel, I, I marvel at how we, we, we use words like, uh, accountability. We use words like um, 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 measurements and, and we use things like trauma-informed care, but the very system itself is creating trauma. Yes, it is. It is. Even it, the Department of Correction pushes this narrative about trauma-informed care. Trauma, you can't, we can't do nothing without trauma-informed care. How, how can you, in, in the same breath, you're creating trauma. You're creating trauma inside the prison as well as outside because you got people in the community who are locked up on the outside. And trauma to the families who are affected. 
Listen, That's man, right. you know, Aaron, you no, you hitting stuff. Listen, I'm seeing things in the in the notes section that um, we want to get some questions coming to the floor. Yes, yes. So we good. So we got a few minutes. So I, I'm going to ask you in just a minute. I'm going to make a statement. Then I'm going to ask you a couple things, just like three rapid questions. But I love you just to take one minute. I'll just kind of go ding, 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 just to kind of answer the best you can. But let me just say this: for folks that are listening and sort of shaking their heads, I'm almost 60 years old. I don't have the energy, nor do I have the need, nor is anybody paying me to push propaganda. I sit in meetings with closed doors with current secretaries of corrections and past secretaries of correction. They have explained to me, lamented to me how the system is broken. I'm a pastor. So when someone says that a priest or a pastor did something bad to someone, I don't say, oh, you're anti me, you're anti church, you're anti, you're talking about the ones who did something bad. We're not saying tonight that every agent, every person who works for DC, DOC, Department of Corrections, is bad or evil. Please don't take that from what we're saying. This is one man who's honest enough to let you know this has happened in his life and it's happening in the lives of other people. But I have talked to former secretaries of corrections. They've spoken at our reentry conference who have talked about how jacked up this system is. In the early 70s, Mark Maurer, who wrote the book, um, race to incarcerate said that the federal government was thinking about closing down federal prisons in the early 70s because they were not rehabilitating, weren't making money, they weren't useful. So they were planning on shutting them down into the war on crime and war on drugs and black people started going to, to prisons and they started making money. This was not some, This was not a direction that the country was going. A, dr a drastic change took place. And for people to be incarcerated, it's got to involve arrests and courts and sentencing and all of these things. And we're just trying to call things out so we can change. We're not saying Absolutely. everybody's doing it, but we Absolutely. have been in rooms with key folks to the governor's cabinet in a couple of different administrations tell us how evil and how wrong the system is. So I just want to say that. Brother Aaron, with the last four minutes, I'm going to ask you three questions just to see if you can just give me a one minute answer. You're on an ankle bracelet for the rest of your life, and that was not mandated by a, by a judge. That was mandated Correct. just someone in the department. Um, um, we can go over your list about things that you didn't do. No one died. No one was beaten. These things, they, But still, you're on an ankle bracelet that you got to charge up and pay for. What's it like to be reminded of the very worst day of your life, every day of your life, when you get up and have mm. to charge that ankle bracelet? What does it feel like? to wear that weight of a reminder of something you did in another life, so to speak. Yeah, it makes you feel like an outcast. Um, it makes you feel like um, you're never, you'll never meet the mark. It, it makes you feel as if um, you wear a scarlet letter A everywhere you go, all day, every day. Um, and it never allows you to have normalcy in the sense of how everybody else is living normal and doing normal things. And I do get to do a lot of things, amazing things, but I also have this reminder every day, all day, about this thing that I carry. And I, I mean, the truth is I call it a, a, a ball and chain because that's really what it is. Now, Aaron, if you live in another you state, oh, Aaron, if you live in another state, that ankle bracelet could be taken off, but if you ever move back to Wisconsin, it'll be put back on. Is that correct? That's correct. Depending on what state you are, and like, but that that's just something just to keep in mind. And this did not come from a judge. This came from state worker making the decision right. to make the community better. Next question. What's harder, adjusting to the power structure inside prison or adjusting to the broader power structure? outside of prison in our community yeah <laughs> what that that's like an equal <laughs> um but 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 outside um it it, it makes me marvel because so i kind of was looking at some of the q and a's or whatever and and i think people think that the attack is on them personally the, the truth is the attack is not on any individual. The attack is on the system and how it's designed. That's right. With that being said, I can go east, I can go west, I can go north and south. What I marvel about, there's not one, Wisconsin is a beautiful state and one I don't feel I should have to leave in order for this to come off. That does not make sense to me. But the second part is I marvel at it's land. It's so much land and it's so beautiful. You won't see one black farmer. Does that mean black people don't want to be farmers? Absolutely not. 
But again, we have created a system in which it ostracizes. And so even in this, wearing this bracelet, it makes me feel ostracized. It doesn't allow me, I, I don't always feel comfortable just wearing a pair of shorts. Right. Right. Or I can't just sleep like everybody else and just roll around in your bed. I got a nice size bed, big king size bed, but I can't just move around in my bed. Why? Because my break, my ankle, my um, uh, charger will break away from my uh, ankle bracelet. And guess what? Then the police will come. And Aaron, we have you've gotten picked up at that barbershop. People, you know, if 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 it's not charged or if it's not communicating correctly, we don't have enough time to say this. Maybe this will come up, Dan and Samantha. But Aaron had a situation where he was challenging the effectiveness of his ankle bracelet. His friend, his family was threatened that if he continued to do that or talk to the media, we might bring that up a little bit later, what would happen to him and them if he suggested that there was some malfunctioning of his ankle bracelet? Right. Like I wouldn't have known it if I wasn't up close, if I wasn't up close on it. These things are, are, are really happening. And so, um, and Aaron, the, 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 the last question is, and I see we're all the time, so I'll just ask this so you can answer fast. The 13th Amendment of, of our Constitution says that slavery is illegal in the U.S. except for incarcerated individuals. Um, so is it true that slavery still exists today? In, Absolutely. In Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, they, I mean, if just, just, just real briefly, if you go over to, just here in Madison, if you go over to East Washington, you can go downstairs at the probation and parole office. You can go in the basement. You'll see furniture, a lot of beautiful furniture that's made right from prison. And guess what? The person who made that made maybe a dollar an hour off of that. They turn around and sell it. They have a contract with all state entities before they buy any furniture or anything that they buy from the Department of Corrections and they charge thousands of dollars for this furniture that the person who made it made a few dollars off of it. So does it exist? Absolutely. And you know, Aaron, in spite of all of these things that you're talking about, the ball and chain, you're still a leader. You're still a father to your child. You still, you still deal with real pushback. You showed me the letter. You are off paper. You can vote in the state of Wisconsin, although you never got a letter okay. saying you are now free to vote. I actually videotaped you voting for the very first time a few years ago. So you have all the, so these things are very real, but yet you're a professional. You help other folks. You, you, you know, you, 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 you interact with judges and, and sheriffs and, and leaders within the Department of Corrections. And so we're not trying to paint a picture of woe is Aaron. In spite of all these realities, this man gets up and comes to work every day. In spite of all of these realities, when COVID hit, I said, Aaron, I know a little bit about you and you, you don't need to be out here. And you're like, man, someone's got to take care of these folks. These men that are coming out, they can't work. You know, they're frontline workers and so they're off work. So we got to get groceries um, to, to them. Somebody said to me the other day, man, I love that staff member of yours who was in a grocery store with a picture of him shopping for people who couldn't go out um, and shop. So in spite of all that's happening, you're still here to build bridges with DOC, judges, um, 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 district attorneys, public defenders, you're still being a part of the solution. So I got your back and stand with you, even when people are saying you're bleeding on the troops, because with all that you've experienced, you could be a bitter person and your commitment is still making sure that this system doesn't continue to be the norm because the people on the receiving end of it are messed up. And the people who are used as pawns to meet out certain atrocities on people cannot be healthy and well either. It's not helping anyone and so i know right. people got more questions for you so i'm going to step back so that dan and and um samantha can ask those questions but aaron i appreciate your honesty um i'm gonna get out of the way so that so other questions can come but man you have helped to open our eyes and you continue to open my eyes and i appreciate it and i appreciate you samantha. thank you kindly thank you both so much for that conversation as always i wish we had so much more time um, and we definitely would love to continue the conversation. We do want to make sure to be able to get into some questions. Um, Aaron and Dr. G2, if you want to be on um, for this and contribute at all to um, these questions that come in, that's awesome. But as we kicked off, we asked our participants to share one word that they would use to describe a good neighbor. And we are just wondering what came to mind for you both when you heard that question and how do you, how does your um, kind of response to that question deepen and expand when it comes to the lens of re-entry. Mm. 
So you want one word? Really just like what your one word, one phrase, just what your reaction was to that. I would just say welcoming. My work with, with, with folks in reentry is not because I'm just this great Samaritan that wants to do good things for people. I realize that Aaron and others make our community better. So when I say welcoming, it's not to them, but they help the community to become better. We can't be great without them. I think what I would say is value. Um, I think that a lot of people don't realize how valuable they are. And so my only agenda is to let people know that greatness resides in all of us. It's just a matter of greatness calling out to greatness. And so that's what I do and that's who I am. And I'm like this every day, so. Awesome, thank you. And we, we did have a few people, Aaron, who, uh, Marilee and Gigi in particular, who said they're now beginning to understand why, you know, recidivism is so high and why so few make it off parole. Someone also said um, basically how you are on permanent probation by having to always wear that uh, ankle bracelet. So I th th that awareness to how this system works is definitely coming in through the comments. Um, and I wanted to, to come back to the feeling that you can't have that normalcy and you, and you feel ostracized. And one of the things we talked about even in preparing for the event is treating those who are re-entering society with dignity. And so thinking to those who are in the audience today, you know, what is the thing that you see people do with good intentions, but ends up not, um, you don't feel like you're being treated with dignity and, and things that maybe we should avoid even though um, we're trying to help. Aaron, I think that's you. Was it a question in that? You so at the, yeah, so at the very end, Aaron, it's more of when, when people with good intentions are trying to help and trying to treat with those with dignity, but maybe it doesn't come across like that or it's not perceived like that. What are those things that you see um, that you think that people should avoid or be very mindful of to make sure that you're feeling like you're being treated with that dignity? Well, I think a lot of times um, people do have good intentions, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but we don't pose questions like, for example, how can I best help you versus as just taking the initiative to do something without even asking a question. So it's really about not so much if your intent is right, if the intent is genuine and is right, then it wouldn't, it, it should never be you taking the lead. It should be the individual kind of guiding you how you can best help them. Because what can happen is you, you can, you can be hurting me in the sense of you want this more for me than I want it for myself. I'm not, I may not be in that space. Right. And so, um, or you could be moving faster than I want to move. So, if you uh, if you genuinely want to help someone, I think that it makes sense that you kind of allow that individual who you feel needs that help to take the lead so they can kind of guide you about how fast they want to move and also what specifically they want help with. Dan and Samantha, can I throw something out? One of the things that's really powerful about Nehemiah is that Aaron is obviously a black man, but his boss is a black man and his boss is a black man and his boss is me. There's not a lot of places Aaron could work where the bosses, the CEOs would allow him to challenge Department of Corrections, uh, Sheriff's Office, Police Department openly and boldly because he doesn't. it's not that he has an axe to grind. We're trying to make a system better that it's got to be renewed. So even the fact that he's working in a place where his voice is validated, where men who have been formed incarcerated are leading this area, not the folks with the doctors, not the folks with the MSSWs, not the people with the certificates, but folks with a lifelong ankle bracelet who came right out of prison to a men's group that he now leads. The, 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 the ability to preserve his voice so that he can say what he says unapologetically today is how we change the system because those who work for the system don't have the platform for saying this. And folks who look like Aaron who work for predominantly white organizations can't voice that without being shut down by either the executives or the board. The unique situation of where he works and how he works allows him to bring all of himself, not just his ankle bracelet, but his voice and his insights. And that is a rare thing for men who have come out of prison to have men or women who are black to have space 
to be not only so in tune to helping people, but so honest about what they need to say. We need to marvel at this because this is what Nehemiah does. This is how we change the face of leadership. This is how we bring about hope, transformation, and justice by saying, tell us what you see. It makes people mad. I'm reading the comments. You know what? I'm not here to placate. My community is dying and rotting in prison. And some people need to be there. I'm not talking about who needs to go. But these incidents that we're talking about, about what happens to folks, the fact that Aaron stayed at someone's home and at his wife's home after he was off a of paper and showed me the letter that said, this is a felony. You are not allowed to stay at your wife's apartment. And this man is off paper like I am. I didn't believe that the state of Wisconsin could write a letter like that until I wrote it. This stuff is real. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited and heated, but I need people to understand Black people aren't just whining. We really have place to say what's really going on. So when we have that space, we're going to say it unapologetically because our community is being destroyed. And the, the uh, sorry, let me shut up right there. Aaron, your hand is up, man. I, I didn't even mean to put my hand up. Oh, I was going to okay. applaud you. I was going to applaud you, but I couldn't. I couldn't use that. So um, no, that, that's 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 real, man. That, we what black. You, what else you got for mind. me, man? Yeah, we're Black men who can speak our minds in this country and in this community, and that has not always been the case. And we can do it without fear of retribution, because this is his lived experience. I watched it, and our funding does not come from those departments. That needs to happen across the country. Otherwise, people are on mute, and that's how things don't change. Absolutely. Oh, this is <laughs> This is a place, right, to have those conversations. That's why we're here, you know, to hear the ugly truth and to work through these things and to be aware and to learn and unlearn, right, so that we can be, um, so that we can be better in our own lived experiences um, and the way that we show up and support. I think um, we had a lot of comments around that, a lot of questions. Kelly asked, um, Aaron, what's the best advice I can give to an incarcerated loved one who wrongly accused will be on the registry um, and bracelet for life. Um, and then Mary Lee also said that she is wondering if mindfulness, med if, excuse me, if mindfulness meditation is ever used in Nehemiah's reentry program to help people deal with the challenges they face and to help build resiliency. Um, so really just kind of questions around like that dignity centered concept, right? So I would just say, um, Yes, we utilize. Actually, that's what I'm doing, a group in mindfulness currently um, with the UW. So that is taking place um, as we speak. Um, and to the latter question, can you just get that to me just one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, so Kelly asks, what's the best advice I can give to an incarcerated loved one? Yeah. Yeah. So 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 one one of the things about incarceration. Um, we, we, we look at it first and foremost, let me just share this. When I share with people today is that incarceration is not limited to a building or a space. Incarceration is a state of mind. We, we have to understand that because there's a lot of people who will never be inside of a prison that is very much incarcerated. Um, when you're not at liberty to be able to speak un, unapologetically, you're incarcerated when you can't. When, when you have to live from paycheck to paycheck, you're incarcerated. These are very, these are real truths. Um, and one of the, so, so to, to that and to the individual who asked that question, one of the things that you can really just share with the individual that is in that place of prison, that this too shall pass, but you should, you should always get the most out of it. Um, had I not been incarcerated, I don't know what my mind would it be be like now, right? And so I learned was my agenda. That's what I've been doing. And so I would just share more than anything, when a person is in a place of prison, you want to just be consistent and you always want to be genuine. Um, don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. You know, because that that helps me, and I believe that'll help that individual who's in prison. Um, we can't live off of woe is me, um, but you have to take it, you know, because you have to take these things and you turn it into something great. So I have learned how to turn my test because that's what it is, is a test. You turn your test into your testimony. And so that's what we do, and that's how you change the narrative. 
And unfortunately, for the sake of time, I think, Aaron, we're only going to have just two quick last questions that I want okay. to group in here. So to the point, though, about um, it's incarceration is not just being in the building. There's a financial burden that I want to point out to this as well. And somebody had actually asked, um, one, how much does your bracelet cost per month? Because um, there's a financial burden to this system as well. And then secondly, somebody had asked, all, you know, with you having to wear that bracelet, is there anything that can be done about the length of time that you're wearing it? So to the first part, um, I pay $240 a month, and that would be for the rest of my life until I die, um, unless something changes. Um, that's a bill that I didn't ask for um, and that I don't want. Um, and it will affect your credit, all of that. So um, um, I have a desire to get my own. I've been living in the same apartment since the day I came home from prison. And I desire to get my own house now. Um, but with that being said, obviously, you already know that it's going to affect my credit due to, you know, and that's a consistent bill and they want their money. Um, so when it comes to just that part, the Department of Correction and all of that, this is more, this has nothing to do with the safety of the community. This has everything to do with dollars and cents. And I just have to share that because that's the truth. Why would you continue to just keep going on and on? It's one thing to get into a fight. Two people get in a fight, you beat the person up. It's a whole nother thing. They knocked out. You, you're just going to stomp on them? Like, they're not even fighting back. And so that, my whole point behind that is now I'm not even on paper no more, and yet you still want to continue to knock the lights out of me, um, and you don't want me to have no liberty at all. And I believe people are looking for liberation. And you said, what was the other question? I'm sorry. The other one was just about the fact that you've mentioned a few times that you have to wear that bracelet for life. And the question was, can anything be done about that other than moving out of state to get that, um, to change that? Yeah, definitely. People can raise hell. Um, that's what you can do. You can you can go to your you can go to legislation. We can have dialogue behind this um, and we can change the narrative. Wisconsin has never looked like this ever. I've been here my whole life. I've been a Packer fan in case you can't see my whole life. Not some of it, not most of it, all my life. Bucks fan, Badger fan, um, the whole the whole nine. I'm a cheese here. It won't change. And so with that being said, we change things by coming together collectively and saying, you know what? Enough is enough. This is not OK. And I think when we do this and based on what this is all about, the allyship, I think we change the narrative by moving collectively together. And I just want to thank Dr. G, were you going to say something real quick? Oh, no, nope, just agreeing. OK, the only thing I just wanted to uh, again, it came like loudly through the comments. So thank you, Aaron uh, and Dr. G, for being so honest in these answers. I think people are taking a lot away. And thank you for uh, addressing some of the other comments that came in that we were not able to get to. Um, and unfortunately, the event always goes too quick. We're a couple minutes past time, but I did want to just briefly um, welcome Haley and potentially RCA to just talk about um, really a, a couple things coming up from a um, educational and volunteer opportunity perspective that you can all do leaving this event uh, moving forward. And so let me share the screen and you guys can, um, I will let um, Haley and RCA talk through those. I'm just here yeah. to really shine. <laughs> um, so I just want to reiterate, thank you to Aaron and Reverend G for this conversation. And after these conversations, people want to know what they can do next. So I just want to highlight our three pillars, educate, donate, and affiliate. Uh, with the educate column coming up, we have the criminal justice workshops with Dr. Karen Reese that are going to provide a really extensive overview of the problematic system in Wisconsin specifically. And that will be a three session session series um, from 6.30 to 8.30 on Tuesdays. And upcoming, we also have our reentry lunch and learns that are every third Thursday. The next one coming up is on October 21st from 12 to 1 p.m. You can go next slide. Our next column is donate. We wanna remind everybody that you can raise funds or gather goods within your sphere of influence. We also have some support for our reentry team that you can donate items that they need through their Amazon wish list. 
Uh, there are a few items on the wish list, but they need a lot of quantities of these items, so that's why there's so few. And also remind folks that you can donate to Nehemiah and indicate that it's for the reentry program, so those funds will go directly to them and what they need it for. And lastly, you can affiliate and come work around us. We have the volunteer survey to get signed up so that you can receive volunteer opportunities. You can follow us on social media to see all the fun things and education opportunities that may pop up along the way. You can always invite a friend to join you at a Nehemiah event to help spread the word. And lastly, you can look into other organizations that support reentry. There are a few good ones, such as the Prison Policy Project and Expo, that also do some really good work educating the community as well. Great. Thank you so well, much, Haley. Yes, thank you, Haley. Okay, so as we wrap up, as Aaron said, we can change the narrative. I hope that that is, you know, a strongly resonating kind of final thought um, as a theme of the night. And that really is why we're here tonight, right? And we thank you for your participation, which makes this event the collaborative success that it is, and for taking this step and activating on um, your and all of our responsibility to really be the change. Um, like we say, and like Dr. G says, allyship is a verb and it is not a journey. It is a journey, not a destination. And it is certainly not a title. And it is about our daily consistent practice. And as Haley just shared, so many opportunities to educate, donate, and affiliate, which is certainly something that Dr. G has taught us along the way. Um, so in elevating our shared commitment as would-be allies, we wanted to share this month's Ally and Action Challenge. We've decided to up the challenge for this month because we know that you are capable. So the first is really a more concrete action of watching at least one of, I think I might have put two in there and I don't know if I adjusted it. Okay, we're going with two. We're going with two. Your action is to watch a minimum of two re-entry lunch and learns, which can be found on Justified Anger's YouTube channel. Um, I think that... Don would maybe be able to share that again if he hasn't already, but to boost that. So we're just going to ask that you take an opportunity to watch two of those lunch and learn sessions um, leading up to the next, um, the next upcoming event in October. Um, and then based on tonight's discussion, our second action is just a commitment to reflecting on the question that we asked at the start of the session. What does it mean to be a good neighbor? And has your perspective expanded? And how can you take action on leveling, leveling up the way that you show up um, to your neighbors and to your and for your community? Um, we want to make sure that you mark your calendars for our next Lean into Allyship event, which will be in November. Um, our date is TBD. We'll get that out hopefully with the follow-up email. Um, we have some really awesome options that are kind of in the works for, for our topics and content. So we will share that out as soon as we have it. Um, Dr. Chi and Aaron, would there be any closing remarks that you would like to leave us with? I know we want to talk about the launch of Black Like Me podcast, um, or the Justified Anger podcast, White and Wondering, which I can certainly cover any of those things too, but just wanted to give you the floor to share any, any thoughts and anything on those pieces. I'll just say something briefly so that Aaron can have the last word. But in certain places, they've had these living libraries where you could sort of check out people or talk to them about their stories rather than just reading a book or listening to a, a video. Um, whenever I hear that, I think of Aaron. There's so much wisdom and depth to his life experiences. I hope people will come to the Lunch and Learns and listen to interviews with him because I think he is the face of what reentry needs to look and feel like. And I am very proud of him. And I just want to say thank you to every person who took the time to 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 just listen, um, and and just really um, just get involved. Um, and then finally, what I would say is, if in fact, so one of my desires is to speak. That's what I do. I believe someone asked me, "What is my superpower?" And that's my voice. With that being said, man, I'm very open. If you guys want me to come speak somewhere. Man, create the platform. I'm ready for you. So it's not wrong to use a. It's not wrong to use a person. It's wrong when you misuse them. So use me up. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening.
Awesome. Thank you, Aaron, so much. Um, yes, as always, so many thank yous for the event to Aaron for joining us tonight, sharing your perspective and your experience, um, your intellect and wisdom and passion. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us and to Dr. G for your vision and leadership um, in the work that you do and the commitment that you make to lean into allyship. To the Nehemiah team, thank you, Haley, Don, Eli, RCA, for your partnership and the passion in the planning and delivery of our ally to um, events that we get to do together, AJ Keeler as well, um, to the generator team for supplying the technology um, that they that they offer to us to support these events from the very beginning when we needed a platform home from which to grow. And they're still here with us today, which is awesome. Um, and just a reminder to watch for a follow-up email um, coming soon with all of the events on tonight and a lot of the things that we that we talked about um, in supplement to this conversation. Um, and really just, yes, echoing the thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us. And we will see you again in November. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.